segue into racing. <laughs> you got a number of questions on racing. I, this one stood out to me. I'll just ask it first. Uh, what was the hardest thing for you to learn when you were becoming a driver? I suspect this is racing, not when you got your driver's license. Right. But you could answer that one too. <laughs> uh, parallel park. No, I, I think the hardest thing is something that I still uh, struggle with is, um, so, so when you think about driving, like what are the sort of elements of it? The first, I, I guess, is sort of understanding conceptually what's happening. You don't have that many inputs when you stop to think about it. You have throttle, you have brake, you have steering, and you have shifting. So, you, you know, you have a clutch and, 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 a, and, a, and a gearbox. Those are your inputs. Those are your tactics. You go up and down on those things. Furthermore, you only have four contact points. You have four tires that touch the surface and everything else is in service of those things. So, and then also in the spirit of fours, there are basically four things that determine how fast you're going to go which is the tires, because they're the contact point, the engine, which provides the power, the chassis, which includes everything from the stiffness of the vehicle to its aerodynamics and its downforce, and then the driver. So you as the driver make up one component of those four things that determines the outcome. You have these four contact points as the tires, and you basically have four inputs. So I think the first thing that one has to learn is vision. Like you have to understand, well, I guess you know, the line slash vision I put together. So there's a, there's obviously a line that a driver takes. So if you're watching a race on TV, you're noticing that all of the drivers are driving in the exact same place unless they're overtaking another driver. But there's a optimized fastest way to go around any race course. And for every circuit that I would drive either, either real or in the simulator, I know the line like inside, like I know exactly where the car needs to be at every moment in time. And I think for some people that takes longer. For me, that was one of the few things that didn't take long because maybe because I'd already ridden a bike so much, a bicycle. And I, you know, in time trialing where you're on these every second counts, like you learn exactly what, where the apex of a corner is, how to take a corner, all of those things. So I think that came to me pretty easily. In driving, you have two types of steering issues when you're going around a corner. Obviously, cornering is what makes driving hard. It's easy to drive uh, in a straight line really fast. It's hard to drive around a corner really fast. And the two things that tend to go wrong are understeer and oversteer. So understeer is when the steering wheel is turning more than the wheels are turning. So that means that if you're trying to turn to a corner of the around the right, your wheels are pointing in a direction that is turning you to the right, but you're drifting to the left. So that's called understeer. You are steering less than you would like to. That is a relatively easy problem to correct. And it's also a relatively easy problem to see because where you're going is not where you want to be going. And that is almost always the result of too much speed that, and again, for every situation you have to decide, are you backing off the throttle? If you're on throttle, you're actually applying brake, et cetera. Oversteer is the opposite of that. Oversteer is the back end of the car is starting to come out from behind you faster than you want it to. So that means the car is now going to turn faster than the rate at which you've asked the wheels, the front wheels to turn. Now, I think learning to correct an oversteer is for me, the, the greatest learning curve because it's not something for which the initial cue is visual. It's actually something you feel. You feel oversteer in your butt because it's basically your butt and the seat are starting to go in a direction that you don't want to go. And there's a well understood way to correct an oversteer, but it's well understood conceptually. It's not necessarily intuitive. The first step of correcting an oversteer is intuitive, which is changing the angle of the wheel, the front of the car. It's the pause and the correction that comes after that is, it's, it's like, and again, I'm positive that there are many drivers out there for whom this was a trivial exercise to learn, but for me, it was not. And uh, in fact, one of the things that my coach had me do was he was like, look, you just got to get comfortable going sideways. And so he sent me off to sprint car school. You know, sprint cars are those huge wheels in the back, little wheels in the front, very small cars in terms of weight and staggeringly overpowered. 
but you're basically driving that car sideways. You're drifting the whole way. I was like, hey, should I go to drift school? And he's like, no, 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 go sprint car. I mean, that's that's where you'll really learn this stuff. I think the other thing that was hard to learn, although I'm so much better at it now that it's, I mean, not to say I'm good at it, but I'm so much better than where I started, is understanding how to modulate, you know, a one out of 10 response on the throttle and the brake. When when you're driving on the street, you're not really thinking of that stuff. You're on the gas, you're not on the gas, you're on the brake, you're not on the brake. But in a race car, even how you come off the brake pedal, you know, if you're at a five out of 10 brake, do you go five, four, three, two, one, or five, three, one off? And those will produce, at, especially at, you know, high speeds and with turns, that will produce a very different sensation. In one of those, you're flipping the car around. In the other one, you're driving quickly through the line. And so learning how to modulate throttle and brake pressure and making those as smooth and elegant as possible, you know, that that took some time. It sounds like playing an instrument. Not that I play an instrument, but if I were to play an instrument well, you'd probably have to know those things. Yeah, and I don't I, play an instrument either, so I can't speak to it, but... Uh, so on the on the oversteer, just because I'm curious, I, I always think of left turns as in NASCAR, maybe just in my head when I'm thinking of, of turning. So if you're doing the oversteer and your your butt sticking out, so the backside is moving out to the right, so you're oversteering. The I mean, you're oversteering and you're moving too far to the left. How do you correct that? So the first thing you do to correct an oversteer, if you're in that situation, is you actually jerk the steering wheel to the right to flip the front of the car. And then you're basically going to pause for a moment and let it correct and then come back onto throttle and pick it around. And so when you watch, look at, you know, there's a guy named Chris Harris. There's lots of guys online that, you know, are great to watch, but Chris Harris is one of my favorite drivers and he's like a drifting machine. I mean, this guy, he's really got it down. But if you want to be able to drift a car, you basically have to put the car into an oversteer and then hold it there for a long period of time. So one of my favorite videos is Chris Harris drifting one of the 911 GT3 991. So of course, maybe we'll find the video and link it to people, but it's uh, he's test driving like the first generation of the GT3 RS. This is probably like 2015. And he's I think he's at the Porsche circuit. And there's this one turn where it's like one of the most beautiful examples of a controlled oversteer drifting around. And it's one of those things when if you watch it and you're not a driver, they make it look really easy. When I watch it, I'm just going, God damn it, how does he do that? Like, Because I'm actually watching the micro adjustments of his hand and I'm like, he is so talented. I will spend the rest of my life trying to become half that good. Speaking of talent... One of the questions is, just comment on the reasons you are a great fan of Senna. You know, I mean, I think Ayrton Senna is probably considered by many people to be the greatest race car driver ever. He died, of course, quite tragically and quite visibly uh, on May 1st, uh, 1994 at Imola in Italy in an accident that is to this day still debated as to the cause of it, though I have very strong point of view on what the cause of the accident was. You know, I think on many levels, one, he was just so naturally gifted. I was talking to actually was one of my patients the other day, and he was telling me a funny story about how he, I, I don't remember the connection. It was like his girlfriend's brother or something like that, you know, grew up in the UK, was, you know, like a guy like me, like not a, not a professional driver, but a guy who really took his driving seriously and had spent years and years trying to hone this craft and one day he's at a track and he finally lets off his absolute fastest lap of his life in this car on this track and this was back in 1980 and there was this kid there and they were like hey can this kid go take your car around for a spin you know he's never been on this track before he's never been in your car before and he said yeah okay whatever so the kid goes out and went six seconds faster than he had just gone and smashed like which was then faster than anyone had ever driven any you know that that type of a car on that circuit and of course the kid was senna so there's just this raw natural talent uh, the other thing i think is just this incredible passion you know there are some drivers like schumacher who you could you could equally make a case would be as great a driver and and certainly by number of championships will be the greatest driver but you know 
had a much less emotional way of going about things. I also think just what Senna stood for both, you know, on and off the track. I mean, I, I think many people were not even aware of how much he cared about Brazil and the people of Brazil until after his death, when people realized how much of his enormous wealth he had contributed to, you know, fighting poverty in Brazil. And to this day, the Senna Foundation is kind of a remarkable organization there. I'm constantly moved by the response that anyone from Brazil has to Senna. Our nanny is Brazilian, and she, I don't even think she was alive when Senna was, when Senna died. But I mean, she knows everything about Senna. We talk about Senna all day long. Uh, my son's name is Ayrton, so you know she just loves taking care of little Ari. We, I was in a I was in an Uber two weeks ago up in San Francisco, and you know the guy had a Brazilian flag all over the car and blah blah blah. And of course, we got talking, and he started asking me about this. And then five minutes into the discussion, he goes, "Wow, you're really a Senna fan." And I was like, "Well, yeah. I mean, that's all we talked about the whole way to the airport." So. You know, that, that you could still find, you know, something to talk about with so many people. It, it's sort of amazing. And, and, and I think many people look back at the era that Senna raced as the golden era of Formula One. Because it wasn't just that you had Senna. It was that you had Prost, you had Mansell, you had Piquet. I mean, you had amazing drivers in an era where the drivers mattered more than they matter today. And that's not to take anything away from Hamilton or Vettel or you know any of the great drivers today. And those two are amazing drivers. I, I think Lewis Hamilton's probably the best driver today. But the cars are so much better today than back then. Uh, so much safer. They have a, so much more downforce. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, I mean, you were basically riding on mechanical grip alone. And when you look at videos of these guys driving, you know, they, there's just amazing things. And then of course there's like, God, I think it was 93. There's this very famous lap at, uh, I think it was at Donington where Senna started in the four position, meaning, so he was fourth on the grid. So didn't have a very good qualifying. And by the end of the first lap, he was in first that, that we should also link to that. I remember that's, you yeah. sent me that link. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that like, that was you, cool. you'll never see that again. That was sort of considered the greatest lap in the history of motorsport. Uh, of course, the other thing that I think is amazing is his qualifying time in Monaco in 80, God, was it 89, maybe 88, where he qualified about a second and a half faster than Prost. And Monaco is a short, fast circuit. It, on the longest circuit, you could never see a second and a half difference. When you see, so you know, in, in racing, we measure things on, on the qualifying lap. They're measured to a thousandth of a second for a reason. <laughs> There's a reason it's not to the tenth of a second, you know, because the difference between 49.47 and 49.49 is pretty big. And those would otherwise both be 49.5. But when you're qualifying ahead of a four-time world champion, which Prost was, a second and a half faster, you're, you're just playing a different game than everybody else. You know, Senna won three world titles, although I, I will always maintain that he won four because in 89, he was disqualified in the final race in Japan for reasons that I think are completely political and completely bullshit. So as far as I'm concerned, his disqualification was nonsense and Senna, was, Senna died as a four-time champion. I'm convinced that he not died in 94, he would have won the world championship that year, no question, even though... It was the uh, Williams 15 car that they were in was having trouble. But the fact that Graham Hill almost won, uh, Damon Hill, uh, the fact that Damon Hill almost won that year as the number two driver tells me that Senna would have absolutely won and probably would have been incredibly competitive for the next two years. So, you know, had Senna not died, I mean, you know, he could have easily had those seven world championships that Schumacher had. But yeah, he'll just forever sort of be my favorite. And I love like, I mean, if anyone hasn't, if anyone's watching this and is even remotely interested in this stuff and they haven't seen the documentary Senna, it's such a beautiful. I was going to ask if that would be the one that you would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. It covers a lot of this. Yeah. 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 For sure. Uh, another racing question. This is a simulator question. How does I racing improve your real world racing skills? And could you do more official races or races with fans? Also favorite car? Um, so iRacing is a software program 
which you run in a simulator. You don't need a simulator to run it. You could probably just run it off your PC and play with like, you know, toys, but in a simulator, it's really designed for a simulator because of how high end it is. Um, I, I think that iRacing is good for every element of driving, but it does have a couple of drawbacks. The first is we were talking about oversteer earlier. And you'll remember that I said that oversteer is not as visual as understeer and that oversteer is something you first feel. A simulator can't really capture that. So when I'm in a car and I oversteer, it's much harder to correct in iRacing because I lose the warning. I only know it's happening when I actually see that I'm spinning. So it's not that it can't be corrected. It's just, it's, it's harder. So it throws your timing off a little bit and what your correction looks like. Uh, the other thing that, you know, obviously a simulator doesn't do compared to being in the real car is you don't have the same physiologic stress. So I probably have more seat time at a course called Button Willow because it's relatively close, meaning it's only like four hours away, but it's in Bakersfield. And I like to go in the summer because nobody else does, likes to go in the summer. I can't understand why. And it's hard. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you're in a fire suit inside of a closed cockpit car when the temperature in the shade is 108 degrees Fahrenheit. It's probably 130 in the car. You know, it's like the little stuff. Like, what do you do when you can't keep the sweat out of your eyes? What do you do when your core body temperature is two degrees higher? And and what do you do when the dust is blowing in and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, so, so you can't, that's just, and to be able to concentrate through that takes practice and you don't get that practice in the simulator. Though, I do like I'll wear my helmet in the simulator and do it in a room that's hot and try to like mimic some of that stuff where the simulator is incredible is just the economics of it. You know, every day you're in a race car on a track, it's thousands of dollars. You know, it's just, you know, unless you're incredibly wealthy, like it's, it's cost prohibitive to really learn how to drive a car well in a car. So just like pilots spend most of their time in simulators long before they're up in the air, it's the same thing. And so when I want to learn a new car or learn a new circuit, I want to get a few hundred hours of that on the simulator before I go there. And it makes the experience much richer. And if I don't have that luxury, for example, Button Willow is not in iRacing. So the first time I drove Button Willow, I ended up having to watch tens of hours of onboard film in, of drivers driving Button Willow. And even that just couldn't prepare me for it the way driving in the simulator could. Uh, as far as my favorite car in the simulator, it really depends on what I'm, what itch I'm trying to scratch. If I'm trying to go as fast as possible, it's the Pro Mazda, uh, which is not the fastest car in there, but obviously Formula cars are much faster than closed wheel cars. And, you know, they, they do have a Formula One car in there. I think they have the MP430. It's just still too fast for me. So even though it's a faster car, the thing's outrageous. So the, but the Pro Mazda, like I'm getting to the point where I can drive that car relatively close to its limit, probably within one to 2% of its limit. As far as closed wheel cars, it depends like relatively aggressive and not that difficult to drive closed wheel car in there, but it's, it's amazing how fast it is, is the Ferrari 488 GTE. It's a beast. And I like the roof 911, which is actually really hard to drive, but it's so freaking powerful. And it's like, that's a car that will punish you just punish you if you make a mistake and there's something you know if you're going to get punished i'd rather get punished in the simulator so it's it's nice to learn that but honestly like you know even driving a miata in the simulator is still a blast cars are just fun to drive so there's one more question it's related it's uh curious what your choice of daily driver is it depends on what one's optimizing for i guess i uh groceries <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're optimizing for groceries, for being able to like pick up your kids, if you're being able to, you know, like I, I used to drive an E92 M3 and that was amazing because it had such a big, it had a big enough trunk that if I took both wheels off my bike, I could put my bike in my trunk. And that was essential when I was like riding my bike a lot because, you know, three times a week I'd be training at a remote location where I had to take my bike. So, you know, to have a car where I could easily move my bike was, was a given. You know, fortunately, if there's one thing that driving in, in a race car has done is it's made me less of a knucklehead driving on the street. So I don't feel quite the need 
or the desire to drive for speed. Fast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought you were setting me up. And we're going to high five. <laughs> top Gun. You know, they're filming a second Top Gun, I'm told. Miss on the top, hit on the bottom. That's the only way to yeah. do it. I, 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 the word on the street is they're filming Top Gun too. I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to see ice, man. <laughs> I, I love 911s. I think they are great. I think no car really combines the practicality of you can drive this car every single day and it's really fun to drive. And so it's like I call it sort of a, a civilized beast.